on the line with us is Professor Stephen Cohen from New York City, contributing editor to The Nation, thenation.com, and Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies at NYU in Princeton. His new book, or his book, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, is out now in paperback. It examines the new Cold War. Uh, you can read his writings over at thenation.com. Professor Cohen, welcome back. Thank you, Tom. Thank you for joining us. I've been uh, wanting to talk to you, actually, over the last couple of days. I keep seeing these reports of new eruptions of fighting in Ukraine. There was a piece in The Guardian that I was reading at uh, 2 o'clock this morning. I woke up, I couldn't get back to sleep, and I'm, 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 I'm reading the online news about how the eighth close political ally or political advisor to Yanukovych, the former president of Ukraine, has, uh, quote, committed suicide. Nobody's buying that any of these eight people are suiciding. Um, strange stuff going on. What What's your take on what's going on in that region? Well, the region, of course, the war continues. There's a tenuous ceasefire, which was agreed upon uh, at Minsk, uh, a deal brokered by uh, Merkel, the chancellor of uh, Germany, and Hollande, the president of France, with Putin and Poroshenko, president of Ukraine, that there would be a ceasefire and political negotiations would begin. That agreement, which I think stands between us and a much larger war, is under attack by its enemies, uh, both with weapons and with politics in Kiev. Uh, these alleged suicides of members of the former government of Ukraine in Kiev and other cities in uh, uh, Ukraine uh, are suspicious, uh, whether they're being assassinated or they psychologically collapsed under persecution, I don't know. But the politics in Kiev are not pretty. There's a struggle for power there. Uh, probably a group does want to honor the agreement made at Minsk and try to move to a political settlement of the Ukrainian civil war. But very powerful forces, backed also in Washington and Brussels, are against it. So what we're watching is a very fateful struggle over whether the Minsk agreements, which again, I think, stand between us in a larger war, will prevail or not. And at the moment, it does not look good. It, uh, it does not look good, yeah. No, um, no. You, you, you're, by the way, your most recent piece for the nation is titled Why We Must Return to the U.S.-Russian Parity Principle. What is the U.S.-Russian Parity Principle? Well, I have to say, and if you could, uh, if, if our cameras could go up over in that direction in my apartment, you would see hanging there a drawing of Don Quixote which I actually purchased in a flea market in Cuba two years ago, uh, partly because I like the drawing and partly because I like the tale of Don Quixote. Yeah. Uh, this is probably a quixotic article, uh, but I've spoken and I've written a lot about uh, the Ukrainian crisis, what I think is a new Cold War, one potentially more dangerous than the 40-year American-Soviet Cold War. And I thought maybe... I ought to try to look ahead <clears throat> and ask, what do we do next if we manage to avert the worst uh, in Ukraine? And I, and the more I thought, the more I realized that the lessons to be learned are back in the previous Cold War. And what I argue in the article, and it really requires much more than this short article because there are a lot of nuances. But during the 40-year Cold War, and particularly from the period of the Eisenhower administration to the Reagan administration, there was a group in the American government, and among those of us who followed this uh, long Cold War and participated in debates about it, that detente was the best policy. And detente didn't mean then ending the Cold War. It meant reducing its most dangerous elements, particularly the nuclear arms race, but not only, by building up large areas of cooperation with the Soviet government. <clears throat> Excuse me, that was detente. But to do this, uh, the, United, the American political establishment had to recognize the Soviet government as a co-equal great power with legitimate interests, and on that basis negotiate where cooperation was possible. And this became known as parity meaning in some ways equality, though not completely. Right. So the issue of moral equivalence uh, was not admissible because there was communism there and there was democracy and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, democracy and uh, capitalism here. But the idea that the Soviet Union had become a legitimate historical great power with its own rightful interests around the world and particularly in Europe and on its borders. And that idea prevailed 
Uh, it was often defeated. It was attacked all the time. I point this out in the article. But in the end, it meant that every time detente lost, and there were four or five major episodes of detente, it was resumed. And what I argue in the end is that when Reagan embraced it, the most unlikely American president, because he had thought to be the most extreme cold warrior in the White House, when he embraced the idea of a detente with Gorbachev, and with it, the parody of the Soviet Union with the United States, it was so successful, they thought at the time, that by 1988-1989, both Reagan and Gorbachev said they had ended the Cold War. Now, whether that was so or not is a different matter, but it was widely accepted. And Reagan's successor, the first President Bush, he did and said the same thing. And then the idea of a parody that Russia somehow had equal standing with the United States in world affairs was abandoned in Washington in the 1990s. And I argue that led to the American policies, including the expansion of NATO to Russia's borders, but not only, to the Ukrainian crisis. So... In conclusion, I argue that we need a new detente. Now, it's quixotic in the sense that nobody's going to listen to me now while this terrible struggle is going on in Ukraine. But it's the sort of thing I'm hoping that some people will think about in two regards. That it was the abandonment of the idea that Russia had legitimate rights that brought us so close to Russia that it led to the Ukrainian crisis. And if we get out of this crisis, it's the only way we can reestablish mm -hmm. A, uh, a cooperative and, and national security partnership with the mm. Kremlin. So that was the purpose of my of my uh, writing this article. Wouldn't that, at a certain level, require our going back to the the deal that was worked out between George Herbert Walker Bush and and Gorbachev, or was it Reagan and Gorbachev, that we would not be putting NATO military on Russia's border? That's right. Well, uh, all the broken promises that were made uh, by Washington to Moscow, beginning with the promise made to Gorbachev, and the people involved now deny they made the promise, but the it's revealed in all the memoirs, it's revealed in archival documents. In 1991, uh, it was said to Gorbachev that if he would agree not only to the reunification of Germany, remember there were two Germanys there, right. but a reunified Germany in NATO, and remember how hard that would have been for Gorbachev uh, to sell in yeah, Russia. Germany, Germany killed millions of Russians. Right. But Gorbachev agreed, and in return he was told, but he did not get it in writing, that NATO would not move one inch to the east from Germany. And of course, NATO's now in the Baltics on Russia's borders. Now, after expansion began under Clinton, he was the one who began this, continued under Bush. A second commitment was made to the Russians that yes, NATO was taking in new members in Russia's regions, but there would be no forward permanent NATO military bases in those new countries. The Baltics, for example, or Poland, or Romania, or Bulgaria, those NATO members closest to Russia. What's happened since February last year, a year ago, is that a group in NATO who always wanted those forward bases has seized on the Ukrainian crisis to start moving to these areas with NATO infrastructure. And as we talk, uh, NATO, including American troops, are parading around the Baltic countries, uh, traipsing with their tanks and their armored personnel carriers and their overflight aircraft over countries close to Russia. So everything has changed now, Tom. We'll be, uh, Stephen, can you stick around for a little bit? Absolutely. Okay, Professor Stephen Cohen is with us, contributing editor to The Nation, Professor Emeritus of Russian Studies and Politics at NYU in Princeton, author of Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, and his new piece for The Nation, thenation.com, Why We Must Return to U.S.-Russian Parity Principles.